Okay, so you, uh, Attila, you already mentioned the very low errors you get in many of these calculations. What what would it take to bring down the errors down to the to the best potentials available? Do you need more data, or is there some intrinsic reason why you can't get any lower? Because you already said you're doing hyperparameter optimization and everything. So do you just need to do more calculations or where are we with that? So um, so we did a very little investigation into that direction here, mm -hmm. uh, but we were limited by the amount of data we had. So I, I'm not sure if you can see it. So the second last row is the same model with two uh, training sets each and the errors are 27 and 12. And then when we double the amount of training data, the errors go down. So we don't know if the errors will go further down if we increase the amount of data. This is something we want to look at and it's now easy to do. But the open question is the descriptors themselves. So there are actually there are two, two points. One is the descriptor. Mm -hmm. Maybe we have not chosen the right descriptor and mm -hmm. A different descriptor will lead to a more accurate representation. And the other is the network itself. Maybe a different uh, neural network will learn more accurately. Yeah. So it's still open. It's not it's still open. Okay. So not it's not quite clear if you just need more data or if there's something else happening. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So Sure. I mean, we tried to cut down all error sources in the theory by doing this uh, semi-analytical integration and so on. So we paid a lot of attention to not introduce any other errors in the workflow from going from post-processing the LDOS to energy. So we are very sure that there is no error there. And most of the error is, or all the error comes from the machine learning. Okay. I mean, one of the very, very open parameters in your whole calculation is, of course, the choice of material and the temperature. So how does that scale? Do, do you need to do all of this all over again with a different material and with a different temperature? And how would you go forward with that? Yeah, so that's also a very good question. So I didn't show it here, but we first did the calculations or the model at room temperature. And there, because you don't have much of disorder in your system and all the atoms are located at their crystal positions, more or less, there the, the, it's even more accurate. I, I forgot now the numbers, but I think it was down to six milliev per atom. And we didn't need that much training data. So what we can, what we know is that disorder in the system makes it more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, now there, now your question about transferability. It will for sure break down when we go to a different material. So if we now take a very different element, like let's say iron or carbon and use this machine learning model, it will, I expect it not to work. It, but it might work if you take something metal-like, like aluminum, like I could imagine if you take maybe lithium, it might not work, it might still work somewhat well. But in general, I would say, if you change the type of material, the, the elements, you have to retrain in general. Mm -hmm. This, is this because of the inner atomic structure, not, not in general of the, so you yeah. could think of as something like an average atom model or something, or some hydrogen-like modeling or something that, that yeah. could at least give you some, some rough idea. I mean, yeah. sure, surely not for, a, for, for material accurate stuff. Yes, because basically the electronic levels will, will shift and change and you switch out the elements. So that will change your inner structure very much. So if you would, if you would put more emphasis on parametri parametrizing this better, would that help? So getting actually more, more knowledge on, on interatomic structure in there? 
in general, like like certain certain symmetries and so on. It, it what, is, would would yeah. that help, or would you say it's hopeless and I have to retrain for for each individual material? Or I think it's hopeless. I would say I I, I think it's worth thinking about it, but it's it will be a major effort to come up with such a general representation that would even work for different elements. How about mixtures? Mixtures is something doable, but you would have to retrain. I mean, you would have to generate um, right, your training data for mixtures, but then that might work. And how about if I would have an AI model for carbon and for aluminum or anything, and I throw these together? To get a mixture of carbon and aluminum, could would I have to retrain or could I use those two? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so you could, what you could do is, right, when you stitch those two systems together, you could think about a different method that puts them together. So you could move that problem somewhere else, like mm -hmm. something like quantum embedding. So the, mm -hmm. there are these quantum embedding theories that tell you how to put together two systems and and mm -hmm. that could be done. I mean, that would be already a major step because then you would just need to do the raw materials and maybe be able to just stitch things together in a, in a nicer way. Yeah, absolutely. That would be, that has more promise than the first idea of um, changing elements. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the changing elements was just nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> it would be too good to be true. <laughs> but, um, but then the other question is your, the temperature question. And that is something that would work, I think. So if you now, I mean, this was trained on the melting point, about 900 Kelvin. But what about going down to 600 Kelvin? I could take those snapshots and evaluate them on this model. And I believe that would work well because a 600, like a, a snapshot of aluminum at 600 Kelvin will look not much different from a 900 Kelvin snapshot. So, and this is something we also haven't investigated yet, but uh, we will probably do that. Kind of, there is a range. I believe there's a range of temperature where this will work. Uh, what, one of the things that you mentioned was that with higher temperature, you, you of course get much more, um, uh, uh, much less symmetry, the, the lattice is melting, you get a lot of disorder. So actually the, your parameter space of atoms where they reside within your simulated volume actually increases. So basically, your your density of states you have it more more randomly distributed in some way, while in the beginning you have a rather nice ordered um, ordered uh, uh, situation. Now, could it be that if you just as an idea, just as an idea, you take you increase even your simulation domain, maybe go to a 512 or something, make it really large. And then you could not just train on the whole domain, but also subdomain. So I would say that, for example, if you have like little disordering, you would probably be able to catch the main order of your lattice already in a, in a smaller volume, because it's just repetitive and you just have to find find that, that order and then stitch it together, while there are also situations where you already in a, at less temperatures have a lot of disorder because you have some dislocation and this increases at some point. And if you have this multi-scale learning approach, then you might be able to catch all these deviations from, from lower temperatures in a, in a more accurate way and then finally basically be able to, to catch all these different changes because I, I, I think they're not, I mean, why, is there, why should there be a difference between the lower right corner and the lower left corner, for example? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's just that you are basically what you're doing is you're always doing a different representation that is 
kind of kind of dependent on the starting conditions and what you're doing there. But in general, um, as long as soon as you have long range order, this long range order is kind of repetitive and happens within the lattice. While if you have disorder, this should be usually local and at some point becomes purely random at very high temperatures. So this means you do not expect to have uh, anything show up on a large scale that does not already show up on a smaller scale. And now the critical thing would be to, to um, identify those scales because what you could then do is reduce basically the burden of uh, computation for learning while still being able to, to identify all the different variations in the LDOS that you're interested in. Because you're basically ta taking the full cube that you're talking about already as a large system that you put into smaller systems. That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if this works and, and what those scales would be and if you still need the whole 256. I mean, how did you come up with the 256 anyways? Uh, we tried to pick the largest cell that was still doable with DFT. Like so we could, do, we could go a bit higher, um, but we are more or less at the limit of what is doable and feasible. So actually we can do higher. So currently we're running a cell with 2000 atoms because the other question is what you wanna answer is, so what about um, take this model and take snapshots with 2000 atoms roughly in a unit cell and do the inference, will it work or not? Why are you? Yes, that's a very good question. I would have gone the other way. Take 128 first and see what the major difference is. It's like a, what you're basically doing is like you're, you're limiting the information and the possibility of states that can, can be occupied. You know, you, what you're basically doing is the more atoms you have, first of all, you get more configurations that are possible if you're increasing the system size. And if you're going to 2000, you get more, you can do more disorder than in 256. But the question is, does this matter? Yeah. Does, or is this already, or is the main information already contained on a smaller scale? And what you then basically do is of course, something like a, um, yeah, like a convergence in terms of particle numbers. So how, how little, numbers of particles do you actually need or system size do you actually need to, to still have some predictive values on the larger scales. Yeah. And of course, I mean, going to 2000 is already something, you know, but going down is the more interesting one in terms of learning duration and optimizing things. So I, my, my, my guess would be that at high disorders, it doesn't at high temperatures, it doesn't matter much anymore. You can take actually smaller systems and at high ordered states, it also doesn't matter anymore. And then there's a sweet spot in between uh, where you need to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that would be my guess and I might be wrong. Please throw things at me, everybody in the audience. <laughs> don't, don't think, don't think I, I have said anything useful. Please, please shoot holes in it. But it's a good point to go down. I hadn't, I mean, we first want to go up just because if we have that result, it's even nicer to publish that. Um, of course. So we, but it's we even nicer that. to tell me that you can use a hundred atoms. You know? <laughs> That's true. So we'll, we'll also <laughs> go down, we'll do both. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, I mean, anyways, uh, a lot of people have done DFT calculations with, with smaller numbers of atoms and they usually look at the convergence there as well. So this should give you a pretty good feeling. And I'm, think, I'm thinking that 256 is already something and the accuracy then is in, to, to me still the question is um, if you would do this hierarchical decomposition, 
if you could, if this would help in actually basically saying the random distributions that are in a quarter of this are almost the same, or, or they, they cover a lot of the stuff that we already do with 256. Mm -hmm. Like, you yeah. know, so, so this is kind of to me, to, so it's, it's kind of a, a, a hierarchy of disorder. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. But I wouldn't know how to actually implement this quite nicely yet. So I would have to think about that. But that could be a nice, nice question anyways. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, we sh maybe you should talk one more time in more detail about, yeah. about this. Okay, sorry for hijacking this with this. No, no, no. I know it's interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, I have two small questions as well. Yes. Um, so the first one is you mentioned already that uh, like training takes like about 90 minutes per epoch and then you need like uh, about 90 hours uh, per, per epoch. So you end up with probably like something like 150 hours for training the whole thing. Uh, so 90 minutes per epoch. 90, 90 minutes, sorry. Yeah. Um, and uh, how long how long does the generation of the test data actually take because I, I think this is this is kind of the, the more computational intensive thing right yeah yes uh, it's comparable um, okay. so well one snapshot takes of the order of let's say eight hours okay but so so basically training is expensive here right it's not it's kind of right. One epoch is a quarter or a tenth of an actual calculation, and we had right thirty snapshots in total. So it's about the same, roughly speaking, same amount of time needed to generate the data and same amount of time to train. But once you've trained, right now we can actually calculate lots of snapshots. So the real use of this will be a dynamic calculation where you don't just compute or use the machine learning inference for a snapshot, but you actually want to do the dynamics. So the dy dynamics of the atoms at this temperature, because then you will do thousands, maybe 10,000 of time steps, and then it will pay off because now we can do 10,000 time steps, each time step in 30 seconds, instead of using a few hours. Okay. This would have been kind of the kind of the next question about oh, this. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. What is the, the, this, is the, this would have been kind of a follow-up question. You're still not safe from my second question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, but uh, considering that now the calculation of the time steps is, is rather short, this could also be interesting for like more, more interactive uh, simulations and visual visualizations, right? Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, what you discussed previously already about the stability of the whole system, uh, unless you, you go like to a different element or something, you still have some, some variation possibility in, in parameters, right? So you could still vary temperature a bit or... Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's the temperature and mainly the positions of the atoms. So they will move in time, right? <laughs> at, at a given temperature, the higher the temperature, the faster they will move yeah. um, and so on. Um, and, and we have not optimized actually the inference. So 30 seconds is just how we took it, but there are things that can be optimized and, and bring it down. Well, we thought there's maybe room for another factor of 10 if you do things cool. right. That's cool. And what's, what's, the, what's the hardware you did the inference on? Uh, these were um, Volta GPUs. Okay. So V100. V yeah, B100. And so now I finally come to my second question. <laughs> okay. So uh, you, you, I mean, I, I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to ask this because you, you said uh, DFT people can ask that afterwards, and I'm not a. Oh, DFT. You, any any question is allowed. <laughs> yeah, no, there is no censorship. <laughs> you mentioned in the in the in the uh, delta function representation that the. Uh, uh, it must not be too wide, right? Yes. 
So uh, is this kind of maximum wideness constrained by some by some other parameter or like by the mean distance between the atoms or something or grid spacing or whatever? Do you have some? Yes, this was a point. So this is this plot, uh, basically, right? You have the freedom to choose how how you want to smear the delta function. Yes. And so basically, we had to, and this is shown here that there is a parameter regime of the width of the Gaussian, right? Where this is fine, right? You see that these are different. Um, snapshots mm -hmm. and for the same smearing what is plotted here is the error in the energy and you can basically get consistent results so we will introduce some error right due to the smearing and here it's about four mev per atom in the band energy but the point was that you cannot well if you make it if you make the width too large, it will be smeared out too much. And then, right, you will not get, you will get a very smooth density of states curve and you will miss these oscillations here that you want to get, those Fanobel singularities. So okay, so these oscillations in the first part are, the, are actually ones you want. Sorry? Yeah, the, the oscillations in the first plot are actually oscillations you want. They are kind of physical. In the black one, yeah. So not the blue one up here. These are the wrong oscillations. This is just noise in the blue curve, the blue dotted. But okay. the black one underneath, actually, this is the correct one. OK. So basically, you have to pick this parameter correctly at the beginning. But this is the, the, the picking of this parameter. This is then relatively empiric or you that do it about empirical, to, yes. according to the plot you have yeah okay yeah that is true and and you cannot and what you can't also do is to pick a very small width right because that will introduce the noise and yeah yeah so you can't say i'll just pick a very small value and everything is fine so that's a little maybe drawback here or something to Keep in mind. Is this really fully? I mean, then you would need probably more points again. So I, I would assume there is a correlation between the number of evaluation points and the, the smoothness of, of, of this thing. And the smoothness factor finally gives you a minimum resolution that you want. Yes, actually, there's the relationship. So it's the K point grid. So you can, in, in like, if you can make your K point grid infinitely. Uh, fine, you can pick a very small value for the Gaussian width, but you can't afford to pick a k-point grid that is too fine because the calculation gets too expensive. The DFT calculation becomes too expensive. So that's I mean, it's a very similar situation to what what we would have in the, that. That's why we are smoothing our particle pick uh, particles in particle in cell as well to to actually reduce that noise. But there is there are kind of rules for that you know they are not arbitrary in in some sense but they are connected to the to, to the to the uh, k grid width here in your case they are connected to the minimum resolution that you want to achieve in some way they are connected to the maximum sampling points that you are doing so there's quite a few things and and probably thinking about them would give you at least some rule of thumb on how to to choose them properly or at least in the right ballpark regime so i'm not thinking they're like magic i think more or less they are there is some some rough estimate and then you fine tune yeah Th yeah that's absolutely true to, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of what we did here but basically because usually people don't compute their LDOS in a regular DFT calculation, and usually people don't compute energies from the LDOS, we had to analyze this ourselves. So there's nothing really known in the literature. So we kind of had to do it ourselves here. But interesting. <laughs> in the end, it's true what you said. There are rules of thumb that we can come up with. And right. it's something we have now a little bit, but we can improve our understanding for sure. I mean, they should come from some systems parameters finally. 
and of course from your ability on how much calculations you can do. Yeah. Any more questions to Attila? Come on, there are so many people in the audience. I can see at least two more. Go on. Uh, well, yeah, exactly, you can zoom around. There's people, people. Oh, text, oh here, I missed you. M mine's quite quick. Um, so in, in like a conventional DFT calculation, the, the, the computational scaling depends on the accuracy of the functional. So in this method, if you trained on a more accurate functional, obviously the training would be more expensive. But is the subsequent calculation is that still kind of the same speed or would that also increase? Uh, oh, you mean the inference, the machine learning inference, yeah. the evaluation of the machine yeah. learning model? Yeah. So the evaluation will be the same, no matter what functional you train on. Yeah. But it's right. So we had to pick right at the beginning, said there are these different kinds of exchange correlation functionals. You have to pick one and generate your training data on. Yeah. And then the machine learning algorithm will is trained on that data, right? It will only produce that data according to that given functional. Yeah. But the evaluation is independent of the choice. Okay. So good. is there like a motivation for using kind of more accurate functionals than you would normally use just because then in that subsequent step there's no... You could, yeah, you could do that. You could, if you're willing to spend enough time into training, you can, in basically you would like to have the most accurate training data you can afford and then train your machine learning model on that. Yeah. And that's another way of building finite temperature dependence because here you're using PB sol, which would not give much difference with PB, for example. Yeah. But let's say if you use hybrid, I think that might give a different answer. Yeah, you can, yeah, absolutely. So you can basically increase your accuracy of of your model by generating more accurate training data. That for sure is true. Okay, uh, maybe I have some uh, question about the same descriptor part. So how it works is you have a grid and then at each grid point you evaluate the shape descriptor. Is that the snap descriptor? Yes. Okay, yes. so and then you, you get one scalar quantity or it's like uh, this 91 components and stuff? Yeah, so each grid point um, here, um, right? So we have, yeah, so we have cut up, we basically have 8 million grid points in our simulation set. Okay. So we decided to pick 8 million. It was, uh, in the end, we took too many, I think, but this was our choice and we had to decide ahead of time what, what this quotization is. Okay. So we didn't want to pick it too small. So we picked that. And then each grid point has 91 scalar entries for the scripter. Okay. And then it's calculated just from the atomic coordinates, atom positions. Exactly. So you basically, that's kind of roughly shown here. It's a, right. So this is the cubes are the, the grid points. The grid points. So you go to a grid point, right? And then you have atoms around. And you have a sphere uh, that, and you will only take into account atoms in that sphere. The sphere okay. And that gives you, that determines what the 91 scalar values are. But then if you have this finite mesh, then you will have either the, how, how big is the circle, the sphere of influence? Um, like how many atoms typically will there be there? Because I, I feel that you, you're getting 91 numbers from maybe like three coordinates or like. No, it's actually, well, that's a good question. How many atoms are there? So basically, then you think about neighbor shells and like the uh, pair distribution function. Mm -hmm. We basically pick a value that, that takes at least two of these shells, or two of the peaks in the pair correlation function. That's roughly speaking how this is chosen. Okay. So there is some, I mean, you can pick obviously pick the radius too small because then there's no active. there's no right there's not enough information about the environment. You can take make it too big, otherwise it, the evaluation becomes too expensive. So it's 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 a parameter you need to optimize. Okay, I I mean that's a very good point. 
uh, in general, if we if we run a simulation, we first do what you would call also a hyperparameter optimization or just a convergence study to optimize your setting in terms both of uh, computational speed and numerical accuracy. And now we do exactly the same thing again. You know, we're basically trying trying not just to optimize the 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 uh, parameters of the neural network itself, but also the way how we basically feed the information from the system into the network. So all of these need basically, if you really want to do it correctly, optimizations. Yeah, yeah. And actually, the machine learning people on this project were very excited about this, <laughs> that they could kind because of... they don't know numerics at all. <laughs> <laughs> first time they ever heard of some ear of something like convergence <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good point yeah and and it's this shape descriptor that is fed into so what is the input layer of the network uh, is it the, just the positions or uh, while training what's in input layer the input layer is it's actually the snap descriptors is the snap descriptors yeah so, so these 91 values okay go in is the input layer Okay. That, that's what I said. You're basically you're basically smoothing out. That that's a lot of smoothing because you're basically you you still would have a much more random distribution if you would just take take the raw data. But now you're you're evaluating it in terms of these descriptors, and because you have parameterized the descriptors, and the descriptors are a good way of of basically covering your your uh, random distribution or your your distribution anyways that's why you get so high quality data because you're basically getting the parameters of the descriptors and not the raw data that you initially worked on otherwise things would be much more messy that's that's quite a smart approach but of course it depends on the quality of your descriptor finally Maybe to, to add to that is, um, so we also did that. It's not also far-fetched a, for a different reason. There is something called the principle of nearsightedness. So it's a quantum mechanical principle that tells you, you can compute basically nearsightedness in the sense that you just need to take account, into account um, a certain neighborhood of a quantum system. And that determines the property of the entire system. That's what I said by that. That's what I meant partially by doing this uh, scalable. Right. Okay. Yeah. That, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So there is a paper by Walter Cohn on this from I don't know forty years ago. I unfortunately I, I need to look at this more carefully to explain it better. But you can show that you can compute <laughs> global properties of the quantum system from local environments, which is gives you some justification for doing this and introducing a sphere, a cutoff sphere. A uh, quick question on that. Doesn't that depend on how much entanglement you have in your system? Because that's what a lot of many body people do. They look at how, because entanglement induces no locality into quantum systems. Absolutely. So you need specific measures on how much space you actually need or how much surrounding you actually need to determine this measure. Absolutely, yeah. So we didn't do any of this here, but I mean, here's obvious, it's weakly correlated matter. But if you go to strongly correlated matter, this will, in a certain sense, break down. Absolutely right. It, no, 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 not in general. It, it doesn't, it doesn't actually mean that the correlation is the problem. You can still have a well uh, justified local description, but a highly ordered system due to strong strong correlations. Entanglement is something that can happen in at distances, you know, you, you might have a rather unordered system that looks rather, rather disordered or very well ordered system, but there are entanglements over uh, large distances. This is a real problem. This ha happens especially uh, at, uh, with, with uh, anharmonic potentials or with uh, time dependent systems. This does not generally happen per se. In entanglement has to be created. Otherwise, you usually end up uh, with 
uh, a, a neighborhood that quite well describes what you're looking at. So I, I would say that you should not uh, you you should not confuse strong correlation always with entanglement and vice versa. Okay. Yeah. In a in a if we I sorry coming from the plasma part. You know. <laughs> Of course, there's also strongly correlated quantum systems again. So yes, yeah, yeah. Mm. Difficult, difficult thing if things also have charge. That's yeah. what I'm saying. I mean, from a large class of materials where this would apply, it's not an issue. I would say weakly correlated matter, which is for most, for many, let's say, material science applications, will not be an issue unless you go to, I don't know, certain sp very specific classes of correlated matter and so on. That would, by the way, be also a very nice thing to look at if we find those um, uh, entanglements in those rather um, um, random distributions, you know, because in a, in, highly, in a highly ordered sense, you can find them very easily. But if we would still have them in there, they should show up, you know. Mm, yeah. Because there's there's something changing and there's something other changing as well on on at another place that is not near the initial change. It might still look random after all, but that could be an interesting qualifier to see whether you can find this in general uh, some form of entanglement here some entanglement qualifier that tells you whether you need to look at this or whether you can take a vicinity here. Well, for those you have different measures and I don't think there's an ultimate measure for that. It really depends on your system. How, what's the best measure to me for entanglement, essentially how to like choose a radius where you are not, where like most of the entanglement connections already are slowed down. To know well, but in but but in general, they would show up at long as probably some form of correlation. Function. Oh yes, definitely. And this can be easily looked at with uh, AI methods in large scale data sets. That would be interesting because then you could basically single those out or these data sets out that make a problem. Very good point. Very interesting. Okay, any more questions? If that's not the case, I, I, I really look forward into making this further, but I want to go down, go back to one of the very first slides. Okay. So no, 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 the one where you showed the scales. Oh yeah, okay, I, this one. Yes, I'm a, I'm a bit worried about this large oh. red blob, you know? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not to scale, right? I, you know, the text, the text is so much, it had to fit into this part. <laughs> 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 I, I would love as a as a gist for this to fill this a bit more with under with understanding and also maybe uh, some methods aside machine learning to to help bridge that gap and I'm and I'm happy we already have some people who are who are working on this um, with us now but I think we need to fill some more of these gaps. So we're quite strong in the blue one. We're starting to get some some stuff in the in the green one, but I would generally not say that that everything in the red one is already solved by what you just presented. No, actually, <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. But actually, the other approach is um, molecular dynamics, right? Which is mm -hmm. most of the red blob by kind of. I didn't motivate it well enough, I think. So what this can be is this, the current red blob 
can generate more accurate training data for molecular dynamics that you can then run on on the mesoscale. Yeah. So this is one of the motivations behind this work is we can, I mean, the idea is we can generate training data of maybe a few thousand atoms that we cannot do currently with DFT, train interatomic potentials, actually, which is something that Kushal wants to work on, right? And then trained, these trained interatomic potentials, then you can run calculations with millions of atoms. Yeah. And that would be a nice connection. That would definitely be a very nice connection. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's thank Attila again. Thank you very much.